Union and the Faithful argument more. I'm not sure if Ken fully holds to that or what his position is completely on that, but we'll be touching upon that more. Okay, you ready? Okay, yeah. Okay, dealing with Trent, I'm glad that we've uh, we've finally brought this up. Earlier in the debate, Mr. Albright says that the church has never formally defined what the form of consecration is. But then yet he turns right around and says that the Catholic Church has formally defined uh, Luke uh, 22.19, Matthew 26.26, and I think is it Mark 14.22 and 1 Corinthians 11.23, all as valid institution formulas. No, I've read the Council of Trent, and I have never seen anywhere where the Council of Trent blatantly says, we declare, we define that Matthew 26, 26, Mark 14, 22, or Luke 22, 19, or 1 Corinthians 11, 23, are valid institution narratives and therefore would validly consecrate or confect the Eucharist. In fact, where he's taken this out of Denzinger 874 is talking about the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist. Like he says we do with Florence, Mr. Albright here is taking this way out of context because he is the first person in the history of the Catholic Church that I'm aware of that has put this forward as theology. Just because there, these chapter, these uh, Bible verses are being footnoted here to make their point does not all of a sudden automatically make make them say that these are valid Eucharistic formulas and that because St. Paul didn't use the words many in his uh, in this verse here, that his mass is invalid. These are scripture uh, passages. They are not uh, accounts of the uh, Eucharistic uh, institutions where they're consecrating the body and blood of our Lord in the Bible. It's not. They're not saying we're having mass and this is exactly what my words are. And here I am confecting the Eucharist. It's not at all what is being said here. And uh, just so anyone knows what eight Denzinger 874 says, first of all, the Holy Synod teaches and openly and simply professes that in nourishing, in the nourishing sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, after the consecration of the bread and wine, our Lord Jesus Christ, true God and man is truly, really, and substantially contained under the species of those sensible things. For these things are not mutually contradictory that our Savior himself is always seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven according to the natural mode of existing, and yet in many other places sacramentally he is present to us in his own substance by that manner of existence which, although we can scarcely express it in words, yet we can, however, by our understanding, illuminated by faith, conceive it to be possible to God in which we ought most steadfastly to believe. For thus all our forefathers, as many as there were in the true church of Christ, who have discussed this most holy sacrament, have most openly professed that our Redeemer instituted this so wonderful a sacrament at the Last Supper, when after the blessing of the bread and wine, he testified in clear and definite words that he gave them his own body, his own blood, and those words which are recorded in Matthew, which, he, which uh, Mr. Albright refers to, in Mark, Luke, in which Mr. Albright refers to by the Holy Evangelist and afterwards repeated by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians, since they contain within themselves that proper and very clear meaning in which they were understood by the fathers. It is a most disgraceful thing for some contentious and wicked men to distort into fictitious and imaginary figures of speech by which the real nature of the flesh and blood of Christ is denied, contrary to the universal sense of the church. So as you can see, and I'm going to continue reading, the Council of Trent did not formally define those verses as valid institution narratives. They used it to make their point saying our Lord is truly present in the body, blood, in the bread and wine, in the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the Eucharist. They're not formally defining that these are true institution narratives and because the words for many and for all aren't there. And if we go back to what I've already said with Pope Innocent III, we know where we get the words of consecration from. We get them from Christ to the apostles, not all recorded in, in sacred scripture. And as the Catechism of the Council of Trent says, some are taken from Matt, some are taken from Luke, some are taken from 1 Corinthians. Not that those passages are institution narratives, and nowhere, nobody teaches that. Not one theologian teaches that. And I would like Mr. Albright to come to the plate and tell me, give me one authority that says what he says about those passages in the Council of Trent that they're referring to, that those are 
valid institution narrative. Even St. Thomas Aquinas says that the evangelists and the gospel writers were not trying to give us the forms of sacraments, but they were giving us the account of our Lord Jesus Christ in his life. And the catechism, or Trent is trying to prove from Scripture the Catholic doctrine of the true, the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. They were certainly not trying to posit them as valid institution narratives. And I'm sorry, William, that's just, I've never heard that before. And when I first heard it, I was just shocked, as I still am shocked now. And I'm curious as to what someone like Mike Duddy or uh, Bob Smugenis would say, and if they held the same opinion as you do. It's just, to me, a, it's just a, a, a far-fetching thing, I think. And uh, I will let you uh, go ahead. I'm done. Okay. I'll start now. <clears throat> All right. Touching upon a number of things that Ken Burt said, uh, I never once said that Trent formally defined the Eucharistic words of consecration. What I did say were that these passages are formally defined, and I find it very interesting that uh, – that Ken brings up and asks if what Mike or what Bob and Jenis would say to this, and in fact, if Ken would like to get in touch with each of the individuals, uh, both of these individuals, both of these individuals were already aware of this, including a number of, of, uh, of in, including uh, 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 if Ken would like to get in touch with uh, Dr. Robert Festigi, who is actually in charge of translating the new Denzinger. He is in charge of translating the new Denzinger. He was aware of this as well. This isn't something that's that I concocted. This isn't something that I dreamt up. Uh, it's something that is commonly known among those that know these matters of theology. Uh, as such, they have valid consecration accounts. Ken needs to understand what the burden of proof is. Ken, uh, Trent has formally defined these. The burden of proof is on him to show why they're invalid accounts. Are they erroneous? Hopefully Ken can show us why they're erroneous. And I'm moving onwards. Uh, I never used Mark. I did not say that Mark was one of the ones uh, formally defined was not. Um, moving forward, uh, if Ken is arguing that the institution accounts are invalid here, then we have to wonder why Trent would formally define accounts that are invalid. 1 Corinthians records a tradition, the words of our Lord. And we're being told by Ken that this is not a valid consecration account. Inerrant, holy Catholic scripture has an invalid consecration account. Paul tells us and repeats the form and says that he received it from God. How can Ken honestly answer that away? Ken thinks that this argument is outrageous. Well, I guess we're, we're coming from different perspectives and because I also think that if somebody wants to take the position that scripture is wrong on something, well, I think that is outrageous because I think the Catholic Church put the Bible together and I think the Catholic Church is infallible. And I believe Trent when Trent said that he, they formally defined these passages. There's a difference between infallibly declaring something and formally defining something as having a truth to it. And if Trent is formally defining this, we need to, re to read and listen to what this is saying, specifically, specifically 1 Corinthians 11. Furthermore, when we examine the construction, which I think is very important, of 1 Corinthians 11:23. It's important to bring this out, and I'm going to examine the New American Standard rendering. We read... For I received from the Lord, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And uh, if we read, moving onwards, I believe, excuse me, parolabon, excuse me. The verb parolabon is quite significant in that it means that Paul received this teaching and he moves on to say from to kuriu, from the Greek word kurios, from the Lord. If the terminology, in, in my, uh, in, in, from the way I see it, from my perspective, and Ken, correct me if, Ken, Ken can correct me if I'm wrong here, if the terminology of for many was so essential, we're stunned, stunned that teaching that Paul received from God himself lacks these very words. Anyhow, we want to know if Ken is of the persuasion that we must have the words for many in order for the union of the faithful to be brought about. Uh, I'm not, I have not touched upon that yet because I'm not aware of Ken putting that forth. I hope he doesn't uh, hold that position. I, I, I think it's a fallacious position. But earlier, um, Ken uh, wanted to, to know about the tradition of the church and what have you. And um, I'll briefly, briefly, I don't have a whole lot of time right now, but um, uh, what I've wanted to focus on for a while and what I think is very relevant to our debate is a pillar that is all too often neglected within the state of a contism, and that is a pillar of tradition, particularly particularly sacred tradition. It is 